the webinar. Um, many thanks to Laura and Rachel for helping sort all of these out. Um, it's, it's great to be able to carry on with these through lockdown. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining. It's great to have so many people watching in. Uh, my first time ever doing a webinar, so I hope it goes okay. Uh, my wife, Jane, is in the other room, so I'm hoping that she's gonna jump in if, if I'm going on too long. Um, and I would encourage questions from anyone anytime or catch me at the end or you can email me or whatever um, afterwards if you've got any other questions. So my talk tonight, I guess, is a little bit unusual. Um, I'm deliberately trying to go for something that's a little bit and a bit thought provoking. And I am roughly going to be covering two areas. Firstly, uh, just by running through some of these slides, I will be showing a few different trips and things that I've been lucky enough to do and hoping that some of those may inspire some of you at the end of lockdown to go out and do some fun trips too. Uh, and secondly, uh, giving some thoughts on living and on dying. And hopefully that'll make a bit more sense as I go and perhaps it has slightly more relevance now uh, in light of, of everything that's happening with COVID-19. I think the talk should take about 50 minutes, um, so uh, it depends on questions and things. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, this is a funny talk to be giving to, to this group of people because I know many of you and I know how fit and healthy and active many of you are. And I suspect the irony of all of this is most of you probably day to day don't think about death very much, but life itself is a non-survivable event. And I think that thinking about your mortality once in a while is actually a positive thing and helps you make the most of being alive. Um, I guess it's important to stress that this talk isn't just about me I'm hopefully using myself more as a as an illustration and, a, and a, a way of prompting you guys to think a bit more about yourself and your own situation uh, and I say this particularly in light of many of you will have are in the middle of or will be going through situations way worse than I've been through um, so I don't wish to undermine anything that anybody else has been through um, by, by, by giving this talk. By way of background, just to sort of set me in context, because I'm aware that some of you won't know me, um, I am the youngest of four. Uh, this is me with my brother Will, and we are in Herefordshire where my parents, I, I grew up in North London, we grew up in North London. Uh, parents were uh, fantastic and very, loving and supportive and, and we had quite an outdoor life, quite an outdoor childhood despite growing up in London. So really in Herefordshire, I guess was where I first got my real love of the outdoors and that sense of exploring and freedom and fun, I guess is at the root of all of the outdoor stuff I've done ever since. So very, very, very formative experience for me. I'm very happy. Uh, and then a number of years later, I uh, was lucky enough to meet Jane, my wife, and here we are. This photo is actually quite old, it's 2009, but with our three kids. Um, so I don't know if you can see my mouse, but that's Jane, Lauren, Jack, and Bella. They're all quite a bit older now. We got uh, the train to Newcastle, the ferry across to Amsterdam, sleeper train to Switzerland, and then cycle toured all the way across Switzerland on our triplet and our tandem. Uh, and for me, anyway, <laughs> for me, I thought this was the best holiday ever. I, I think the kids uh, really enjoyed it and they still talk about it now. So I, I guess it can't have been too horrific for them. Uh, they're all quite a lot older now. Um, and uh, outside of family, I work for a startup medical software company called My Way Digital Health. And we have a website and an app that helps people with diabetes to improve their management of their condition. So a, 
that's kind of a little bit of background. The next few slides um, are very specific to me, I guess. Um, I'm attempting to highlight, perhaps not very clearly, what I enjoy most about living. And kind of going back to what I said before, the aim here is really more just to help you begin to think about what you most enjoy about living if you've not already done that. And I guess for me, probably the headline is, it's all about family and friends and life enriching experiences. And hopefully I've covered already a little bit about family stuff. So in the next few slides, I guess it's slightly more about friends and experiences that have stuck with me. And one slide that captures that quite well was taken, I must have been aged about 23, I'm now aged 51. And this is a friend of mine called Robbie Burns. I now know that when you're looking for somebody called Robbie Burns on social media, 27 years later, it's actually quite difficult to find somebody called Robbie Burns. Um, but what I like about this photo is it encapsulates, I guess, a lot of what I'm trying to cover in this talk. Firstly, that life is pretty amazing. And when you have an experience like this, that still makes your hands sweat 27 years after you did it, you know that you're probably doing something right. And I guess it's the perfect metaphor because it shows how amazing life can be, but it also shows how tenuous life can be. And Rob only has to lift one or two fingers and he's probably not gonna be in a great situation. And in case you're wondering, this, uh, these rivets on this bridge uh, is taken at this point here. So this is Sydney Harbour Bridge and I spent a year working in a climbing shop in Sydney. And my last week in Sydney, four of us ran along the railway, which was, I think, a thousand dollar fine if we'd been caught to find the middle vertical on the bridge. This was an entire rope length to get to the horizontal. And going from the vertical to the horizontal was a full body length of an overhang. So by the time Rob has caught these rivets, his feet are swinging 150 feet above the bridge, the deck, and about another 150 feet above the water. And when a lorry would go over this bridge, you would feel the whole bridge judder. And for anybody that's climbed, to go from hanging just by your fingertips to getting your feet to where his hands are and then to standing up is a move called a mantle shelf. Um, and it's, in this situation, is reasonably non-trivial. So it all adds to a very memorable uh, life experience and something that's a lot of fun. Um, and the view from the top, I guess, was part of the reason we did it because this is a scanned slide. For those of you that are pre-digital era, everything was taken on slides, so it's all a bit washed out, but it was a pretty amazing view and we managed to get down without being caught. So it was uh, doubly good. So yeah, I guess that's, that's kind of part of uh, what I enjoy about living. And going back to that slide of me in Herefordshire, I guess another element is that sense of exploring and fun and I guess play. And so shortly after the bridge, I went on a five, six week bathing expedition to Northwest Thailand with a couple of friends and um, we were basically wandering through the border with Burma, uh, discovering caves and exploring them and mapping them as we went. Uh, one of these was quite a big cave. It had been entered before. We were, I think, the second people to get to the very back of the cave, which was seven kilometers from the entrance. And we spent the night and the whole of the next day exploring even more and finding a whole bunch of new passages and things. Came out into a, a forest fire. That was all quite memorable. And this is all parked away in, in the sort of memory banks. And when time, when, when you go through difficult periods of your life, it's lovely to be able to fall back on these really intense memories. And, and I suppose <laughs> um, 
it was all uh, quite a surprise uh, two years ago when this fairly obscure cave called Tam Nam Lang reached international fame as the site where the Thai football team uh, got stuck. They were quite near the entrance uh, and there was that huge international rescue. But it was amazing because I could kind of picture where they were and I could picture the whole cave having, having been there myself. Um, fast forward a number of years, I did a master's degree at Leeds um, and at the end of that I was lucky enough to get a job in California and took the job, um, well at least half the reason for taking the job was because it was near some very good climbing uh, and so I spent most of my holidays, well all of my holidays, uh, climbing and here is, um, for those of you that have been to Yosemite, um, this is now the second time I've climbed El Capitan. Uh, this time in the picture is at the top of a famous climb called the Salatho Wall. Uh, it took me and two friends five and a half days, so sleeping on little ledges as we go. We've got the benefit of ropes and hardware and the climbing I found reasonably taxing and when it got really hard you could actually pull on the bits of gear that you were putting in the rock uh, and even doing that, it still took us five and a half days. Again, sense of, of, of fun and play and life enriching experiences. I think also setting yourself big challenges that you have to kind of work towards and break down. And when you do achieve them, they can be very lasting senses of, of satisfaction. Um, and again, a bit like the cave, uh, to my surprise, um, this climb became quite famous a year ago with, for any of you that have seen the film Free Solo with Alex Honnold, um, his Free Solo was about 80% of the same line that we climbed. And I have to say, having ascended that same piece of rock is utterly inconceivable that somebody would climb it free and with no rope. And it took three of us five and a half days what he did in less than four hours, it, it is, it is mind bending. Um, anyway, so, um, so um, on from this uh, to um, extremely happy day where Jane and I got married, uh, Jane's from California, and we left a church or a reception in Huntington Beach, California, which is near where I was working. And uh, that is the very sort of southwest tip of America. And we then spent the next three months and 4,700 miles cycling across to the northwest tip, northeast tip of California, which is sort of Boston. It's not quite northeast tip, but certainly Boston. It's sort of bottom left, top right of America. And in terms of life experiences, I guess it doesn't get any better because it's uh, a bit of an adventure. It's uh, time together with somebody you love and, and incredibly memorable. So uh, it was very lucky to do that. And shortly after this, we moved back to the UK, moved up to Edinburgh, and in about 2001, I think, um, joined Kenethi. And by this stage, we'd started a family. And I kind of chose really to move from climbing over to running. Um, and uh, through Kenethi, met a whole bunch of fantastic people and did all sorts of brilliant trips. and made a whole bunch of friendships that are still the basis of, of, of all my friends in Edinburgh now. Um, and running kind of migrated really from, started jumping over the barriers at the London Marathon in 1998 to uh, hill racing and then longer runs and then had a brilliant project with, uh, with several Edinburgh friends to do the three 24 hour rounds. So I uh, did the Bob Graham, in uh, 2004, the Ramsey 2005, and then took quite a long time to do the Buckley. Um, and here we are uh, in 2010, having finally done it, sort of in between family and injury and all these things. And mind blowing that somebody like Jasmine then goes off and does all three in, in a single summer. But I do lay claim to the most incompetent completion of the Paddy Buckley. Um, each of these rounds, for those of you that, that, that don't know, it's like a 24 hour time trial. 
in the mountainous regions of, of Great Britain, so in the Lake Districts, in, in, uh, in the Highlands near Ben Nevis and in, uh, in, in uh, Snowdonia, but you're basically running a continuous loop of the classic mountains in each of those regions. Uh, they're typically around 60 miles long and typically about 25,000 feet of ascent. Um, and doing all three, I think when we finished, we were sort of maybe mid twenties in terms of the number of completion people that have completed these things. I think it's probably a few more now. But anyway, finishing the Buckley, there are 47 summits that you go over. I'm holding the map because after 22 hours of continuous running and lots of up and down, I got to the 46th summit, so the penultimate summit, and had a brain freeze and thought I was on the final summit, so I made a sprint for the finish. And about 20 minutes, half an hour downhill, I had this horrible sense that the landscape didn't look right, and I thought I'd blown it. And uh, to my immense <laughs> determination, desperation, whatever, I managed to reascend took the 47th summit and still managed to finish sub 24 hour, which was a, a huge relief. Uh, anyway, a lot of brilliant fun along the way and really good friendships, really nice sense of, of, of sort of common projects with your, with your best mates. Uh, fast forward a few more years, uh, two of our kids start to get into climbing. And so I kind of start doing a bit more climbing and that's, that's generally going pretty well and enjoying it a lot. Great to share that with your kids. Um, until uh, June 2016, and I hit the ground <clears throat> from 10 meters. Not not particularly great feeling, uh, a break or vertebrae in my back. And here I am on a spinal board in the back of the ambulance. The ambulance is in the climbing arena, which I was amazed that an ambulance could actually drive into the climbing arena. Uh, and my, my memories of this uh, were spinal cord is quite rigid and even with the suspension of a Mercedes ambulance uh, it was still quite a bumpy drive to uh, A&E and a few days in intensive care uh, long enough to kind of message everybody and say I'm in hospital and um, broke my back and I'm going to have to you know stop work for a while and withdraw from any races and things that I'd entered uh, and everybody was very supportive of that except two of my friends in Carnethy. So some of you probably know Jason Hubert. Some of you probably know Graham Nash. I think Graham might be on this call. Uh, and what I like about this photo is, is uh, Graham has been shrunk to the size of a six-year-old, which is kind of where his mental age is most of the time. And Jason and Graham being good friends were the only people, when I texted them saying I'd broken my back, they were the only people that said, oh, don't worry, Ollie, you can still stay in our team for this race, which started nine weeks and two days after I broke my back. Just decide a few days before the race, you know, you've paid for it, see how you're feeling. And I just laughed it off. And nine days and two weeks later, I thought, well, actually, I can't feel all right. And I'll start. And if it hurts, I'll stop. So here we are, uh, probably several days into a mega classic race called the Petit Trot à Lyon, which is a big circumnavigation of Mont Blanc through France and Switzerland and Italy. Um, it is um, 300k and it is something like 26,000 meters. It's done non-stop. Um, so part of the game is sort of minimizing sleep. So uh, it's for us was, was five and a half days on about two hours sleep a night and the rest of the time you're either moving or eating um, and I was absolutely delighted just to be on the start line I was pretty delighted to finish um, and, and I guess I was just really surprised at the end it was it was reasonably taxing because it was the middle of a heat wave and about half the teams dropped out I think possibly because half the teams dropped out we ended up coming seventh which um, I, I, I was quite pleased with um, and uh, massive thanks to uh, Graham and Jason for giving me the bad advice to, to, to carry on and stay in the team. Uh, meanwhile, all of this is very much aided and abetted by my wonderful wife, Jane, who uh, here we are on a hill walk in the Highlands, has been massively supportive throughout all of this. 
I'm getting a bit cold. I'm going to stick a jump on one side. Oh, that's bad. Um, so, living. Uh, it feels a little bit naff telling, telling you what, what, what is important for me in living. Uh, but I'm only doing this, as I said before, just to prompt you, if you've not done this, to actually consciously stop and think about what's important to you in your life. So for me, it is family, friends, and life enriching experiences. For me, it's also challenging yourself once in a while, setting yourself a big goal, working towards it, hopefully uh, succeeding. But I also am a firm believer that if you're setting yourself challenges and you're always succeeding, that means your challenges are too easy. And if you are failing once in a while, I think, that probably means you're much closer to your limit, which I think means things are much more rewarding. Um, and it also means that you get an opportunity to embrace failure as being a good thing and you can learn from it and improve and go back and try again and hopefully succeed. And when you do succeed, it is doubly satisfying because you've had to work at it. Um, through all of this, just just being reminded that beauty is everywhere, that uh, you know it's in the big mountains and it's it's in all the small stuff that's around us every day that we don't always notice. And definitely thinking of seizing the day if you want to do something, organizing your life to actually go and do it rather than leaving it till you're retired or till a rainy day because that day may never come. But yeah, what does it mean for you? Moving on to 2018. Um, still relatively recent and just a few slides, but just to show that 2018 was a year like, uh, I, I, like many others for me, it was, it was um, started with uh, in the springtime, went out to the Alps, to the Keras region of the Alps and had a fantastic ski tour with four really good friends and uh, I'm absolutely rubbish at skiing, but loved being in the mountains and trying to get marginally less rubbish at, at ski touring. And then in the summer, I was in the Lake District uh, with my friend Jason, and we were attempting 24 hour uh, fairly esoteric rock climbing challenge. So in 24 hours to roughly climb about the same height as El Capitan over, I think something like 15 big mountain crags, uh, 32 miles of running between them all. I don't think it's been done that often, maybe about 10 times. Um, and I guess a sign of a good challenge for me, uh, <laughs> sign of a big challenge is when you're pushing yourself hard enough that you start to hallucinate. And I think mentally you go to some quite interesting places. And generally with running, that's, that's been okay. It's all been kind of fun and something you remember all the more when you finished. But I found 20 hours into this, when I started to see hieroglyphs on the rocks and I started to see piglets running across the hillside wearing leather riding harnesses when we actually didn't have any climbing gear of note between us um, that this probably wasn't quite so safe and we were climbing what's called simul climbing so two of us climbing together on a short rope it means that if either of you fall um, the very best outcome is that you would both fall a very long way and probably equally probable is that one or both of you might hit the ground. So um, so called that off and um, learned what we would need to do differently next time to succeed. And um, actually, in this case, quite happy just to go back and finish it on a second day. I think to do it 24 hours, you need to be climbing it without a rope at all. And um, thankfully, at my age, I don't need to do that anymore. Um, so that was the summer and then in the autumn in September <clears throat> a mega classic bike challenge this is called the Raid Pyrenees uh, some of you on this call have probably done it for those of you that haven't I would strongly encourage it and it is 100 hours non-stop well uh, sorry 100 hours to cycle from the Atlantic to the Meds over all the classic Tour de France cols in the Pyrenees um, and uh, 
it's that's like it's four days and plus four hours. Uh, here's a classic picture of somebody going over the Tourmalet um, and that massive respect. That's a big hill, and to do it on a bike like that, on a road like that, it's, it's hard work. Uh, and we got across, got to the Med. Here's a bunch of people you'll recognize from Panethi. Uh, brilliant trip, felt fit, healthy, really enjoyed it. That was the 21st of September 2018. And shortly afterwards, was on a local bike ride with friends in the borders. It was a bit wet, it was a bit cold. And literally on one bike ride, I went from being fit and healthy in the middle of this ride to all of a sudden feeling like I was at about 5,000 meters, like I had a clamp on my chest or a big rubber band. And I couldn't breathe properly and I couldn't keep up. And initially I just thought, well, It'll, it'll pass and I kind of ignored it for a couple of weeks and then started to affect running. I couldn't really run anymore. Start to affect my climbing. I couldn't really climb anymore and um, went to see the GP and very quickly uh, things escalated and I went from a scan. I'd get called that afternoon, someone back in for the next scan, called that evening, someone back for the next scan. And initially I just thought the NHS was being wonderful and efficient. And I guess what I didn't appreciate was things were actually really quite serious and each day was probably counting. And very rapidly, the uh, very clever doctors worked out that I had a type of blood cancer called follicular lymphoma. And the tumor was blocking uh, my lymph Glands and it's like almost like a parallel circulatory system to your to your blood, but is is for largely the transit of uh, your white blood cells and your immune system, I guess, but also part of the processing of fat in your body. And so this fluid <clears throat> was backing up into the nearest available cavity, which was the pleural cavity of my right lung, and it was creating something called a chylus effusion which was basically fluid that was collapsing my right lung. And that was because it was a large tumor, 16 centimeters by eight. They normally start chemo when a tumor is seven centimeters. So um, I took that to be uh, quite large. And consequently, as soon as all of this, I mean, it, uh, all of this information is coming at you in a single meeting. And consequently, the following Monday, I think the Friday I had a, a drain fitted and the following Monday I started six cycles of chemo. Chemo itself, um, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and I guess the other key thing for me was I'm kind of lucky because my cancer is treatable, but I guess less lucky that it's not curable. So with me, it's going to be uh, when it when it comes back, it gets treated again and I get a chunk of remission and then it'll come back treated and then shorter remission treated shorter remission so it's almost I sort of think of it as a bit like a half-life really um, and so here I am uh, having had a manual drain of my chest hopefully you can see my mouse um, I'm extremely needle phobic uh, I pass out with needles really quite easily so the first drain was manual if you just imagine large bore needle being stuffed into your lungs and a bunch of fluid being taken off that was fairly unpleasant and then the fluid was continuing to build up so they stuck about i don't know probably at least a foot of piping into my pleural cavity so that's it entering my body it's then tunneled under the skin along the ribs and then exits into this pipe and the idea is i'm then free to drain myself at home because by this stage my breathing was about 40 percent of what it should have been and it stayed at that for weeks probably 10 weeks maybe before before it improved and before the pipe came out anyway just to give you a flavor of this um i'm hoping that some of you have just had your dinner um because this is a movie no sound i'll, I'll, I'll narrate but basically, I've got a <clears throat> 16 by 8 tumour spanning right the way across my abdomen. 
I have never felt it. I have never noticed it. It was invisible to me, um, but it was big enough that it was causing fluid to back up into the pleural cavity of my right lung. This is the pipe that you saw fitted in the last picture. It was um, covered with sterile dressing and several times a week, I would be draining off the fluid so that my breathing, uh, uh, so that I could continue to breathe. Um, and it's all done very sterile. It's wearing, wearing gloves. I've got this little sterile station and I plumb in the pipe. I press the magic button and this is a vacuum bottle. So it's actively pulling out the fluid, the pilot's fluid. And here, here goes. And I've got to say, the first time I did this, I nearly passed out. And, <laughs> and I'm not sure it got any easier. Uh, I never really got used to doing it. And it initially was painless. And then uh, I, I, the drain itself was, was a source of continuous pain, but the actual draining uh, basically got kind of morphine levels of of pleasure towards the end. And um, it got to a point where the morphine wasn't even cutting it. Um, and it's interesting seeing this video now because I was constantly out of breath and uh, even breathing, even talking was difficult. And watching this video, I noticed that only my right lung is moving, um, which kind of shows that things were reasonably advanced. Um, Oops, sorry, don't want to show you that again. So uh, within a couple of days of that, uh, I'm in Ward 1 at the Western General and receiving the first of my six rounds of chemo. Uh, I massively, massively underestimated chemo and it is, uh, it deserves its reputation. Um, The, 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 the regime I was on was kind of medium severe um, and uh, the nurses and everybody was absolutely amazing. I, I couldn't have been in better hands, but just the, the, the sort of combination of physical, um, just what it does to your body. It's like your body's been filled with lead and your eyeballs feel pressured and, and when you, when you come out, you spend the first 24 hours, just the stuff that when you go to the loo, the stuff coming out is just so noxious. You want to, you want to throw up and you're feeling sick anyway. And it takes about three weeks before you start to feel vaguely normal again. And then the mental torment of knowing that you're going back in again the next Monday to be reset all the way back to zero. But in reality, it's probably beneath zero because each cycle gets harder because your body gets hit harder and harder. Um, and I guess it's important to realize that this stuff is so powerful that it totally destroys your immune system. And uh, you need to be hyper careful about where, you know, it, it's a bit like COVID actually, just, just about who you're seeing and scrupulous washing your hands all the time and stuff. Um, so, here I am with a chest drain, very large tumour, just started chemo, and I kind of think I understand what's going on. I kind of think I've got the nature of this, and then things get substantially worse. Uh, a week later, my breathing basically stops, and um, I've got to say this out of all the, the various kind of close shaves and adventures and things, the single most terrifying moment of my life and this last about 90 minutes was my breathing basically stopping and making it in by the skin of my teeth um, and being put on oxygen and um, nobody really knows why it's just it was just one of a number of things that happened where they just said well we don't know and uh, we're glad you're better you're actually going to be safe for getting out of the hospital because you've got no immunity. So I had a few more days at home, just, just recovering from this. I was, I was quite tired after this. Uh, and I think about another eight days later, <clears throat> I then have massive veins uh, radiating out from my heart. I'm in the back of an ambulance with a suspected heart attack. Uh, that wasn't 
fantastic feeling either. Ended up in A&E. Um, I was <laughs> in A&E in my own cubicle, which I guess was, was good. And I was in the cubicle kind of long enough. I was there through at least half the night. I was there trying to work out what was going on. Long enough to realise that I'd probably been in that same cubicle three years earlier when I'd broken my back. And uh, I got to say that breaking my back felt like a summer holiday compared to just a single round of the chemo, of which I was getting six rounds. Um, and again, I was discharged from this. They, they, they couldn't quite work out what was going on. And then um, about a week later, I think possibly because I'd been in A&E and I'd possibly been exposed to sick people, uh, I then picked up a very high fever. I was in for a week over Christmas, 40 degree temperatures day after day. I really wasn't that conscious. And I guess when I was conscious, um, um, was having some pretty dark thoughts. And I guess the hardest of those was thinking that I was going to leave my kids without a dad. Um, and that thought was so awful that the only way I could deal with it was just to stop, just to just to stamp out the thought, just not allow myself to go there. And um, uh, I rallied after I came out just after Christmas, a bit surreal coming home, finding all the presents open and, you know, post Christmas, um, but, uh, but did rally. Uh, went in, was just about to go in for my third round of chemo and uh, picked up another infection. And this time, uh, you kind of like to think that things are, you, if you take the treatment, you like to think there'll be a sort of linear progression and that you'll gradually be getting better. I guess I learned that that wasn't always the way and that for me, I had a number of, uh, um, I hesitate, these were, I hesitate to use the word disaster, but I guess I had a bunch of times where things got substantially worse before they got better. And, and this was definitely substantially worse. I picked up another infection, days on end of 39, 40 degree temperatures. Uh, and by this stage, I've lost a whole bunch of weight, lost all my hair through the chemo. I've been in hospital long enough on really heavy duty intravenous antibiotics to pick up C. diff. So I'm now in my own isolation ward, which was pretty tough mentally. My drain, I've still got my drain, uh, and the pipe is generally going down, but that, that's not actually producing any more liquid, any more chylus fluid. But they pick up a whole new diffusion at the top of my lung. Again, they don't know why. So I then get a tap, it's my third big needle into my lung, and they drain off this bag here, in addition to all the stuff I've been taking off myself over the last eight weeks or whatever. Large tub of mayonnaise, not sure what that's for. Um, and uh, the very distance of this window over the rooftops of Edinburgh, I can just about see the summit of Alamere if I kind of crane my neck. And the sense of just like just losing everything, you know, the, the, the days of carefree running over the top of Alamere and, and here I'm doing well to get 10 meters to the to the toilet uh, sense of everything just slipping away um, and it was in this state that I realized that I wasn't going to get out uh, in time to finish organizing a local hill race I've been involved with for a number of years called the Kanaki Five and I send a message to my mates Graham Nash and John Ryan and Alan Morton Lloyd in the morning and showing what an amazing club and what an amazing group of guys they are. They dropped whatever whatever they were doing and uh, came in to see me the same evening, took over the race. And for those of you at Kanaki 5 2019, you owe a big, uh, we all owe a big debt of thanks to those three guys because they did a spectacular job and I think the race went really, really well. So thank you to all three of them. Um, so yeah, treatment, um, I, I suppose I had a lot of people, I, I had an amazing group of friends, my family were 
fantastic. The NHS was fantastic. Um, and I suppose just a small detail, but it's funny how people would often say to me how brave and strong I was. And I guess this kind of lodged in my mind because there were long periods where that was exactly the opposite of how I felt. And for long periods, I felt that I was really doing two things, which was surviving. That was all my energy was going into simply surviving and into enduring. And that was all I was doing. And I was thinking hour to hour, day to day max. And uh, wrapped over the top of this, because I guess by preparing this slideshow, I realized that there's a certain sort of timeline and a certain narrative to this that makes sense now. But I guess it's really hard to stress how much uncertainty there was around all of this, that there was no guarantee. They didn't know what was going on. I mean, they, they knew broadly what was happening, but they didn't know the detail of some of the bad stuff that was happening. And they didn't know if I was going to get better or worse. I didn't know if I was going to get better or worse. And, and it's really only with hindsight that it kind of falls into place and makes sense. So uncertainty is, is another defining characteristic, I think, when you're properly unwell. After about the third round of chemo, I, I came very, very close to stepping off chemo altogether. It was so it was so difficult. Um, not just the chemo, but but all of the complications on top of it. Um, but after about the third cycle, I entered into a very gradual kind of virtuous cycle where the chemo had shrunk the tumour enough that the chest, the, 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 the colour suffusion had, had dried up and the drain came out. So I was in a lot less day-to-day -day pain. And then I started to have a bit more space mentally to think uh, and set myself one or two projects to work on. Um, and I found this very, very uplifting and positive and one of these the simplest was I wanted to go wild camping at the beach and so probably after about my fourth cycle I think uh, with Jane and Lauren and a good friend of ours Nigel uh, we went out to Tinningham Beach near Edinburgh and the sound of the wind in the trees and the waves crashing and the stars was just amazing a real sense that you were reclaiming just <clears throat> just five percent of your former life you know just getting out there was quite a big deal and just walking in was quite a big deal I, I, I had absolutely zero energy for months um, and when I finished this I was back on the sofa again for days just recovering but it felt amazing and then made it all the way through six cycles and uh, came out and when I was talking about beauty everywhere, big and small, I guess I feel I've always been good at getting kind of the big trips and the big experiences. And I guess what cancer and surviving cancer has helped me realize is, is much more of the everyday beauty that I was too busy to see before. And um, just looking down at this bucket of flowers just immediately outside Ward One. And it, it's really beautiful. Um, and <clears throat> I guess I feel lucky because that, that continues to be the state that I'm, I'm in every day I wake up. Just so grateful to be alive and so happy and so positive about life. And that was April 15th, 2019. So that's almost exactly a year ago. It's a year and two days ago. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can't do the math. A year and six days ago. Um, and yeah, completing treatment, I suppose I was a bit surprised, uh, you've, you've kind of reclaimed your life and you, in any other circumstance, would imagine these massive surge of elation and happiness. And I guess for me that, that absolutely wasn't the case and I had no elation whatsoever and my abiding feeling 
was 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 two things. One of relief that I'd made it through, and uh, with a, a, a sort of almost at the time an almost parallel level of intensity, but a feeling of, of trauma. You know, I'd gone from being fit and healthy to being incredibly unfit and incredibly unhealthy, and had a pretty horrible chemo regime laid over the top of all of that. And I suppose I continue to have these feelings today. The the, the sort of trauma ebbs and flows. So I've noticed it's, it tends to be bad with significant anniversaries. So the sort of anniversary of when I was diagnosed or the anniversary of starting chemo. But then it's less for the good anniversaries. So, you know, April 15th was a lovely day this year because that's kind of when I felt like I was reclaiming my life. Anyway, uh, hopefully that's... <laughs> It's meant to be honest, it's not meant to be quite as depressing. I hope it hope, hope doesn't come across as too depressing. Uh, and in the course of this, I felt like I learned quite a lot. And I'm putting this under the heading of dying. And for me, I guess the things that I felt I learned was how quickly it happens. And kind of going back to that picture of Robbie Burns with his fingers over the rivets on Sydney Harbour Bridge, that it really can go from fit and healthy to big problems more or less instantly and that's how it was for me it was on a single bike ride going up a single hill that i noticed i couldn't breathe properly anymore um, i think right from childhood i've always been scared of death and i i appreciate the irony isn't lost on me that i ended up chasing a lot of experiences that uh, perhaps more dangerous in terms of some of the climbing but I guess looking back on it they were also the ones that made me feel most alive and maybe made me feel most alive because I was cheating death perhaps um, and what I learned through my treatment was that you do get you can get to a place where you are so sick and in so much pain and there is no sign of any improvement. In fact, it's probably getting worse. Uh, and there's no clear outcome from any of this where you realize that actually death can be a release and death can be a good thing. And for me, that was a really valuable thing to learn firsthand. And I think now I'm much less scared of death. And I think I'm much less scared of asking people. Um, so sort of, um, parents, I suppose, or, or you know, parents of friends or whatever, who may be very sick and maybe approaching the end of their life, of just stopping and asking them what they want. And in the case of COVID, for example, that for old people, the risk of catching COVID and dying may be preferable to the loneliness of living by themselves and sure, maybe being a bit safer when they may only have another year or two to live anyway. So just, just a, a thought for, for how we speak to people about death there, I guess. One thing that sustained me all the way through, right from the very darkest days, and, and was really my biggest gratitude for a long time, it was my own, <laughs> it was the only thing I could think of for a long time, was I am so grateful that this has happened to me and not to Jane or the kids, and just how much harder that would be to be on the edge of this and uh, and then as I started to get better from probably about the fourth round third or fourth round of chemo onwards I could then extend that sense of gratitude and I would fall asleep each night with a list of all the little gains that I'd made so it might be things like I'm not in hospital I'm not on IV antibiotics I'm not getting blood tests several times a day and um, I'm not say uh, I haven't got I've got Jane's cooking instead of hospital cooking um, and I could get this list easily to 32 items each night it was a bit like a mantra and I think it's I think it's a good thing to do I think just to be positive and to remind yourself of good things in your situation for me are, are definitely helpful um, and I can say this with some authority now because I've been through this twice in, uh, in, in recent years, breaking my back and then going through all this. 
when when things go totally wrong and you are potentially taking your own mortality, I think two things go through your mind. And I think the first is you cast back over the life you've lived. And I think you're likely to be the harshest critic of how you've lived your life. And uh, I think it kind of gets back to the interplay between death and life, that one way of being happy with where you're at and what you've done is to do as much as you possibly can of the things you want to do. Um, and I guess I'm lucky because twice now I've kind of cast back over my life and twice I thought I am actually pretty, pretty lucky. But I've led a pretty, pretty amazing life. I'm, I'm you know, definitely, uh, definitely one of the lucky ones. And then in both cases, as things start to improve and you start to realize that there may be a future beyond your immediate challenge, I think the next thing your brain naturally does is starts casting forward of, wow, I've survived. What does life mean now? What, what, what sort of shape do I want it to be? And, and I suppose in a summary, it's all about identifying what is important to you in your life and making active choices to focus on those. And that's kind of why I gave the slides at the beginning of this about just starting to think about what's important about living for you, because that is, uh, there are much easier ways of reaching this realization than breaking your back and catching, uh, catching cancer. Um, a bunch of people, I think, sometimes would say things like, you know, you've been really unlucky with your back and then with cancer. Uh, and I guess that's just not how I see it. I see it as a part of the human condition that we're all destined to have some pretty big setbacks um, and hopefully you won't break your back and hopefully you won't get cancer. But uh, I think it's fair to say everybody's going to face big, big challenges. And maybe the trick is how you choose to deal with those and move on with your life. And, um, uh, I suppose, yeah, I, I, for me, my, my, my cancer is incurable, so it's going to come back. And in a way, I think that's firstly a great deal better situation than many other cancer patients face. So once you've been on the cancer ward and you realise how widespread it is, how indiscriminate it is, and how awful it is for so many people, that, again, I feel really grateful. I've I, in, in my periods of remission, I am completely back to normal. And it also means that I'm never taking for granted my, my life again, because, you know, it has a finite end. It does for all of us, but I guess it's more real for me. Um, and I think that's kind of a gift. I think life is enriched when you're living much more in the present. And I think nowadays it gets a sort of trendy name of mindfulness, but that, that is how it is for me. Um, and uh, again, I say all of this, not just to go on about me, but to use it as a way of encouraging you to think about some of these things for yourself. So a week after finishing, um, I'm generally pretty wasted uh, and uh, really still not, not very well. And a week later, a good friend of mine in Edinburgh called Penny, uh, we go for a walk up Turnhouse and leaving the car. I mean, normally a run that I would scarcely even register before. And I'm now looking up at Turnhouse from the car park. I have no idea if I can walk up there anymore. And when I do get to the top, it feels indescribably amazing. Um, the fresh air, the view, the hills, I'm back doing something that I really love doing. Uh, so the playing in the wind at the top, it was just, just amazing. So um, it, about this point, and J Jane's been incredibly, my wife Jane's been incredibly loving and supportive and has shouldered 50% of everything that I've described. She, you know, she lived and, and she was picking up the pieces. And um, Jane very wisely said, look, you've had a bit of a rubbish time, you need to restock on some positive life experiences and so 
uh, I didn't rush back to work and um, three weeks after finishing chemo, I'm on, but yeah, so, so just that wonder of being alive, what just, uh, and I still have it. I'm, I'm in some ways the luckiest guy alive because I have that sense of wonder at being alive every day. Um, three weeks after chemo, a good friend of mine, Al Brightman, takes me up to the northwest coast and here we are at Neast Point on the Isle of Skye. Again, amazing place, fresh air, views, um, and again that sense of just working out what I can and can't do. So we're abseiling in to climb these sea cliffs and I'm abseiling in. I'm thinking, I don't know if I can climb out and um, luckily Luckily, it works. It worked out well, and it was was fantastic. Very, very healing, I guess, to be getting out and doing these things. Um, and then three months after finishing chemo, we're back in the states. Um, Jane's parents aren't very well, so we were back out providing a bit of support. And I snuck out a couple of days early, met up with an old climbing friend, and um, we went to climb. I call them Pinnacle, which is in Tawny Meadows, which is part of Yosemite National Park. And this is a picture of me uh, three months post chemo. And I'm putting it up not to do a sort of classic show off, aren't I amazing? It is more that this picture perfectly encapsulates for me one of the key points I've been trying to make through this talk, which is just how wonderful it is to be alive. And to me, this, this photo says it all really. Um, and shortly after this, rejoin the family. And I guess that's the other theme about what is important to living for me is, is, is a really nice time with the family. So here's our three kids last seen on the back of the triplet in Switzerland, but this is what they look like now, uh, Jack and Lauren and Bella, um, and have a fantastic family holiday with, with them all. Um, and then they came back and then four months post chemo, one of the, when I was well enough, when I was getting better, I, well, when, when after that fourth round of chemo and I was focusing on things I wanted to do, um, the other thing I found positive was to dream of doing a long distance hike. I figured that I should be able to do a hike um, and one that was, was reasonably easy to escape from if things went horribly wrong again. Um, and my brother Rob, who's been very supportive through all of this, he he's a, was a GP and was basically my contact with the outside world when things were particularly difficult. And, um, and so it was a wonderful trip to share with my brother Rob, is to go off and do uh, a walk called the Hope Route Pyrenees. It's basically the, the sort of highest walkable path across the Pyrenees um, from the Atlantic to the Med. Uh, and for the middle two weeks of this trip, uh, we were joined by a good friend of mine in Edinburgh called Ken. Um, and so the next 11, 12 slides, um, I'm just going to paint a picture of what an amazing trip this is. I'm not going to say anything. Uh, and the aim is twofold. It's firstly to inspire you because this is a really beautiful walk and I think many of you would enjoy doing it. But I guess also to try to give a sense of what it felt like for me after everything that I'd been through um, and the sense of healing both physically because you're going through the mountains every day and fresh air and exercise but equally important was how valuable this was mentally and the sense of decompressing and I'd like to say that I was having really profound thoughts but I wasn't, and it was just emptying your brain every day when your brain has been so rammed out of nowhere and so serious and you know so much discomfort and pain and all sorts of horrors that you, you, you really wouldn't want to do again. And just this sense of almost being born again, I guess. So anyway, here, here are the slides. I'm not going to say anything, and uh, I hope you enjoy the photos.
And here we are <clears throat> at the finish. This is me and my brother Rob. And a, yeah, it's, it's just it just felt fantastic um, to, to 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 reach the med. And and by sheer coincidence, it was exactly a year to the day that I'd cycled there in, in, in September 2018. Uh, and just with so much happening in between, uh, it was. You know, inconceivable that I was now well enough that not only could I have cycled it, but I actually managed to walk it. And um, the guidebook walking time is 44 days. We managed to, to walk it in 28 and a half days of, of, of walking. So not only that I could do it, but I was probably back to a reasonable, reasonable level of, of health and fitness as well. Um, and for those of you in Carnethy or anybody else on this call, uh, go and do it. It's brilliant. You, know, you could do it quicker than that if you went very lightweight and stayed in huts and things. Um, so I suppose one of the other things I learned here was how you deal, how you help other people. And, and I had so much love and so much support. And I can't even, even in all of this talk, I couldn't express enough gratitude for, for how much help I, I had from, from family and friends. But in this, I guess I did learn what's helpful when you're helping other people. And I guess the key thing to remember when you're helping somebody else is to acknowledge it. And even if you don't know what to say, all you have to say is, Holly, I'm really sorry to hear that you've been unwell. That's it. You don't have to say any more or any less. And I suppose more of a, a detail, but you really, really do not need to fix it or to make it better. And I guess the example here is many, many times, and I don't know if people were filling the silence, or, 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 but they would often say to me things like, um, you know, my uncle Jimmy has got lung cancer and he's been through 10 rounds of chemo and he's completely back to health again. And I would be thinking, I'm really pleased for your uncle Jimmy, but I'd also be thinking, that has absolutely no relation to what I'm going through. My, my journey is so different to everybody else's. So I guess just, just remember, you really don't need to fix it or make it better, but you really do need to acknowledge it. I, I hopefully I've alluded to this already, but it's, it's absolutely not just about the patient. I, I reckon it's 50-50 what the patient's going through and what their immediate family and friends are, are picking up. Um, so uh, we had uh, some amazing help. Um, I guess this maybe kind of comes into the next point, which is help is uh, is often provided. I've done this myself many times, which is you know the classic. Let me know if I can help, um, and all I can say is on the receiving end, it's twofold. It's firstly there are periods where you are so into just raw survival that you're actually incapable of even thinking what needs to be done to provide help that would become an extra burden and you're trying to remove any burdens from the person that's that's unwell uh, but what is helpful is proactive help and it is our many wonderful friends who would uh, make a proactive offer so you know can we bring you some frozen dinners stick in the, free, in the freezer just to keep you going for the next few days. Can we bring you these shopping items from our supermarket run? Uh, and I guess the most extreme and most wonderful version of this was we had two different friends, groups of friends who took uh, two of our kids on two different holidays. Uh, and that's amazing because the kids are having a pretty grim time through all of this as well. So that kind of ties that. It's not just about the patient and being proactive. In, in your help. And I suppose turning this around, uh, we ended up back in States at Christmas as well, Christmas just gone, because uh, my wonderful mother-in-law, who is one of the most amazing men, most generous and decent and honorable and really, really, really good person, is now very unwell himself with complications of liver cancer and just going out there and just being there for him and taking him for a push along the the boardwalk in his wheelchair through to 
literally putting him in bed at night and putting him in his pajamas stuff that you never dream that you're going to do but i think is something that connects us all as, as human beings is is to reach out and help other people in their hour of need and i suppose for me it was nice to repay just a tiny fraction of all of the love and support that people gave to me so in conclusion um i guess one photo that kind of summarizes summarizes quite a lot of what i've been trying to say tonight is this one and some of you may recognize this it was local hill race the con 85 it was february the 15th this year and it coincided to the hour to the height of storm dennis and going over this was the fourth summit uh, west kit in the Pent local pentland hills uh, the wind was so strong that these guys at the back are crawling to get to the summit i've never seen that in a hill race before this guy's trouser leg if you just look at the shape of that trouser leg it kind of gives you a sense of how strong it is and i particularly like this guy's cheek because you can see that the wind is so strong it's actually blown his cheek in and meanwhile you're being fired with these big fat globulates of of, of rain at 65 miles an hour into your face I, I was still weather beaten about two days after the race but it was the most life-affirming experience it felt absolutely fantastic to be there it's something that i will long remember and is kind of one of the key strands of this is stopping and thinking about what's important to you in your life and making active choices to prioritize those equally it is actually stopping once in a while <clears throat> and reminding yourself that life is a non-survivable event and you will die and using those two to make the most of your time on this earth and in my mind i think the two are linked by where and when you can reaching out and helping others because I think it's part of what makes us human. And so your homework from this talk is a very simple question. And the question is, is this. If you knew if I had a magic wand and if I could tell you when you were going to die. How would you change your life? I guess that is one of the positives that's come out of my experience is I've kind of been handed this and I feel my life is richer now as a result. And I hope that many of you listening to this can reach a similar level of enlightenment in a much easier and a much less painful way. So thank you sincerely once again to my family, to my wife Jane, to my kids, and to my extended family, to all my amazing friends, to the NHS, and I guess the other amazing organization I was introduced to through this was Maggie's Cancer Support. I hadn't scarcely heard of them before. I'd heard of them, but I didn't really know what they do. And they've been amazingly supportive and continue to be to me and to my family. Um, and collectively you've given me well <laughs> i would have said a second chance at life but um it's probably my third or fourth um by this stage and um i guess thanks to all of you listening i hope you've enjoyed this um here is a link we're raising through all of our winter talks we always fundraise all of the money for the talks goes to the chosen charity and the other speakers for these webinars have been kind enough to kind of put together so we're all focusing at Maggie's so if you've not already given uh, do please think about giving some money so if you go on to Just Giving and Google kind of who talks you'll find it if you've got anything you want to get in touch with me uh, about there's my email address uh, I've covered just a fraction of, of what happened and um, you know thoughts around how to help others and what does it feel like and if you have cancer how to talk about it with other people I've kind of covered a lot of that 
in an FAQs document I've written. So there's the link. If you've got a um, one of those QR readers, you can get to it there. So um, thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, do please let me know. Uh, leave the chat window open or come off mute. Um, but thank you very much for listening. <laughs>